have never done anything with biology in, in my life. Um, I took it in ninth grade, and I was determined never to approach it again because the problems were way too complex. Um, and also, you have to deal, well, at least at that time, I thought with human beings, not microorganisms. If they had a real good microbiology course, maybe I would have, I would have looked at it a little more. But um, there are a lot of challenges in this field. Uh, a good friend of mine who was in astrophysics uh, switched to doing data science down in Australia. And the first project he was assigned to was to work with uh, some of the biologists down there. And he said, my god, it's like they're 15 years behind where we were. And, and they don't have the computational tools that they need. And this is a real challenge. And this echoed comments that Sarah has told me over the year about the field, about how people collect data, about how people um, even just annotate the data, um, how the experiments are run, and all the challenges associated with it. Um, she is zero BS, and that is what I love most about Sarah, is that w when I ask her opinions about quality of work and people in various divisions at our lab, she can tell them to me straight, and, and I absolutely 100% believe her. And so I think the approach that she's taking here is really exciting for this field. It is in its nascent stages, I would say, and there is a tremendous amount of potential here. So thank you, Sarah, for coming. Well, thank you. I hope to ease you in a little slowly to something that is, I, you haven't had a biology talk. I apologize. We for have you. not had Okay. Biology. Well, I will try to <laughs> ease you into it. It's a... Uh, an interesting parallel, honestly, when people ask me why I study bacteria, I always tell them that I wanted to meet aliens. I watched a lot of Star Trek. I really wanted to make first contact. And as I grew older, I had to accept that I was not going to get shot into space to meet aliens. But luckily for me, the aliens are here. Bacteria are the most alien form of life on the planet. That is a bacteria called Myxococcus thanseth. It moves through the soil crust. It prefers to eat E. coli. It likes to bump up. It's like a Saturday Night Live skit. Remember the guys who just go up to ladies and, you know, baby, don't hurt me. It just vibrates itself against the cells until they lice, and then it eats them. When it backtracks along its slime mold that it leaves behind, it forms these blooming bodies where half of the bacteria die to feed the other half, so they form spores. And when people first observed this, this is a very old graph, they thought they were fungus. They were so complex. They have some of the biggest genomes among bacteria. This is really strange. And we know nothing about them. We know that anti-cancer drugs come from them because they have to coordinate across cells. So there's secreting compounds that communicate with each other. We cannot get them to change when they do that or how they do it or the components with which they do it. They are very alien. They're living their own lives. Here's my favorite piece of information. I read it out of a book from 1920 about this bacteria. If you want to go catch or, capture some in the wild, you should use wild rabbit poop, not domestic rabbit poop. There's a difference. What is the difference? No one has bothered to track down. For me, this is a very pertinent clue in what these bacteria are doing, why they're doing it, and how we could get them to do it for us more efficiently than just out in the wild, but we haven't got that data. Here is the basis of biology you have to remember and then forget for this talk, is that everything has DNA, and that is the easiest thing to read about it. That is absolutely the easiest thing you can get a sequence data. It didn't always, that wasn't always the case. When we got all together, to do the human genome and every other genome. It was not easy to do sequencing. That was a huge effort that took a lot of people all over the world to bring that technology down to commodity, but now they have. So we were really shocked when it turned out that humans for three billion bases had fewer genes than a worm. No, <laughs> the, the data, the sequence is a really interesting dimension of things, but it is so much easier to read than to understand. So right now we have run ahead of ourselves. We are sequencing all kinds of environments and we get this DNA. Ask them what it does. And besides make a pine tree, they don't know. They don't know, we have not broken it down. This is one of the fundamental challenges that I hope to begin approaching is how can we actually turn all that information into knowledge? 
So think of it, I want you to think of a genome, all that sequence data that we can get about any organism as a cookbook. I want you to think about it as a collection of successful recipes from history. So these, that, that's obviously not a photograph of a dinosaur, but the dinosaurs still live today, we just call them birds, right? The, and a bird's genome is a collection of the recipes that worked well together to get it to today. If you read its bird genome though and just get the sequence, it does not necessarily tell you which bits are still good, which bits are just still hanging around and used to be good, and which bits are good in certain situations like the bird needs to lay an egg but doesn't have enough calcium, or the bird is wet, or the bird is suddenly swimming. You do not know which things are working just by looking at a static shot of ATCG. We do not have the information for that. Well, if the genome is a cookbook, the planet is a library. This is really irreplaceable information. And so sequencing is a good start. I am not trying to slam sequencing, but it is not enough. It is like writing stuff down in a language that you can only half read. We still don't know what it's saying. The other thing is that no organism is an island and we're constantly changing each other. This is where function becomes really, really important. When and why are we actually using sequence and what does that sequence actually mean? There are more bacteria on this planet than anything else, except for viruses. There's more viruses on this planet than anything else. And we still don't know what the sequence they're carrying around and changing is doing. Agriculture, however, gives me hope. Agriculture is the original genetic engineering experiment and it was undertaken without any sort of regulatory oversight at all by termites and damselfish. These fish will pick out fungus they don't like growing in coral so they can plant an invasive fungus that they do like to eat. Tell me that's not farming. <laughs> by doing this, they are changing the genome space of the coral, of the fungus, everything adjusts for this insult to environment. There's monkeys now in Japan that apparently are training deer. They hear the call, they feed the deer, they ride the deer around. They have other behaviors with the deer that are interesting to animal behaviorists. Ants have been milking aphids. School kids know that ants milk aphids. Um, those termites have fixed this fungus the same way we do, fix a population a genome so well that it breeds true, just basically made it clonal. Those termites did that. You can have control over an organism. You can influence its behavior without really understanding the sequence function thing. It just takes forever. And we've done it. So all of these are the same species. These are all mustard. But you select over time for the flowers and you get cauliflower. You select over time for the stalks and you get kohlrabi. You select over time for color and you can get kale or cabbage. But they're all technically still the same species. You crossbreed them and in the 80s you get something like broccolini. So we, are, we have pretty good control over these functional things in this plant even though we still don't know which DNA sequences are doing each part. So of course we've done it on a larger scale too, right? All of these things except for the cat, we would consider domesticated. The cat can't be domesticated because I leave it in the backyard, it will go catch stuff and sustain itself. If I leave the dog in the backyard, he needs to find a patron pretty quick. So that's the difference for me between tame and domesticated. This is great bioengineering. This is really great bioengineering and we really accept that this is bioengineering and we have managed to make lasting changes in these organisms. They don't look like they do in the wild. One of the things that happens when you domesticate organisms is they start to turn white, which is really weird and nobody knows exactly why. They start to exhibit, especially in dogs, more immature behaviors, like child puppy-like behaviors because they're dependent on you. We're not allowing them to reach a full maturity. So definitely changes in the DNA that we are doing over time. We're definitely seeing that. When it comes to microorganisms, we seem to have slowed down. Yeah. I would think that we're domesticated. Does that mean we're becoming less mature? How long does it take kids to move out of their parents' home yeah. now as opposed to <laughs> before? <laughs> there's good sides and bad sides. I'm not saying it's bad to hang out with your parents until you're 21. And definitely that's, there's also cultural things. But yeah, uh, it's a mark of wealth or resources that are being put into the system, how quickly you have to be going and getting your own resources. So I, I think that's... The, the point is that a genome is not a static thing, ever. When it comes to microbes, we have really sort of narrowed our repertoire. So these are all products that we get from pretty stable microbes. 
So you get your beer from yeast. We've been working on that yeast for 6,000 years for beer and bread. Xanthan gum, all of the xanthan gum on the planet is made in a bacteria called Xanthomonas compestris. Pickles, that whole process is controlled by bacteria. That really ancient food preservation technique is about the right bacteria in a jar. And the way you make sure you get the right bacteria is to make it really acidic, and they make it acidic, and you preserve that. That's how you get pickles. All right, that just blew my mind. <laughs> Pickles are my favorite thing. I oh, okay. I saw you putting a ton of soy sauce on your I lunch know, today. I know. That's, That's the yeah. All bacteria and yeast. Yeast ferment the soy sauce, but all MSG on the planet is made in bacteria, Corynebacterium glutamicum. All of it, 100%. It's way cheaper to do it that way. Cheese, Streptococcus thermophilus, other associated fungi. I mean, you get that really nice ripe stuff. That's some really nice ripe microorganisms. Olives, this is, I am not a big olive fan. I always say this is a plant that is trying really hard to get us not to eat it because you have to process it very heavily. And a lot of that process involves bacteria. So then you get into things like, well, vinegar obviously is acetic acid bacteria. You start to get into medicines. And this is where we've probably made the most and the least inroads. Erythromycin is one of those antibiotics that the World Health Organization says, if your country doesn't have it, you are in trouble. It's a very basic, antibiotic, very effective still, and it's only made in a bacteria called Saccharopolisporia erythrea. There's no chemical synthesis route for it. So in order to get this antibiotic, you grow up a bunch of bacteria and then break them and take the antibiotic out. It's the only way to do it. This is a, an immune suppressant that comes from a bacteria. That's the only way to make it, is to grow a bacteria and get it out. They cannot edit these bacteria. They can't reach in and say, can you make more in the same way that we, well, I'll get to that. The, this is just the state of the art right now is some of these bacteria we've been working on for thousands of years. And we're still not exactly sure exactly what makes them so good at this. We just sort of bred them like dogs. So the history of bioengineering fits on one slide. We discovered DNA and RNA makes sense now. We can copy DNA. The DNA and the RNA encode proteins. You guys have heard the you know codons, you have A, T, C, and G in the DNA, and you take that long string of A, T, Cs, and Gs, and in certain sections of the genome, you can read them in groups of three called a codon. So A, T, G means the methionine amino acid, and then A, T, A would mean the isoleucine amino acid. And so this forms a code that you translate into proteins, and the proteins then take on a secondary structure. They, they get folded, and they actually now have a, a mechanism of action. So the shape that they take on informs the action that they take in the cell. If you change the DNA, you change the protein, you change the protein structure, you change the protein's function. So now everyone's excited. Okay, we, yeah? Well, not to, so, so we're still not at, at a multicellular animal there. We're not even at a single cellular animal on the, on the, the Oh, no, th this is all inside every cell on the planet. No matter what kind of animal it is or a single cell or you, Everything works like this. Nonetheless, my dog, dogma says that the other stuff is, is derived in some way with some kind of an environmental inter interaction with some kind of that, that environmental interaction includes, in a multicellular case, interaction with each co other. You know, Co-originating uh, yeah. cells. So, so there, there's, there's more of this, and that's just protein. There, I don't, I, no, no cell walls, say for instance. Oh yeah, no that's, organelles. that's where you get into, well, I can explain organelles. Organelles are uh, cells that used to be independent that got subsumed into another cell and then just lost independence. Does that make sense? Okay, it's, it's just, to, just not questioning, but trying to understand how, how, much, do, how, much, how, much, of the, how much dogma coming from the DNA sort of winds up governing physiology. Oh, it's all still context dependent. So your protein is going, your DNA is absolutely going to say ATG, GCGA, right? But when it gets read into RNA, there are mistakes. When the RNA gets translated into protein, there are mistakes. And then when the protein folds, there can be mistakes. Now, if your protein folds at a pH slightly higher, even if everything else was perfect, your protein can take on a different conformation and work differently. It's completely structure dependent. Can you have two different proteins that take on the same shape? Yes, we think okay. so. Yeah, okay. and this is a huge um, area of computational and modeling is how can you predict what shape a protein will take just from the sequence? And that's an unsolved problem, you can't. We cannot predict what, so no one, no one, I don't know, care what you've heard from synthetic biologists, no one's designing genes from scratch. 
they can't. We are so unable to predict how DNA will turn into protein in the end, like what DNA sequence will form, what shape in the chemical activity space, that we just borrow genes that we've seen from all over the planet and try to tweak them. We do not start here and design backwards. Never happens. So, could you say that, that because it's context dependent, it depends on, on the sort of cellular reactor within which those proteins will, will combine? Which is a form of epigenetic memory. Yes, so the state we are in now has, depends on the state we used to be in, and, and that's not necessarily encoded in the DNA. Right. It just feeds back to it, yeah. right? So if you happen to look into a state that's good, your DNA will remember that part for the next state. And that's why I tell people that cells are information and memory. The memory is the DNA, but, or the information is the DNA, but the memory is the cellular state. And there's a lot of stuff in there that cannot be coded in DNA, and it's just being passed down from successful cell to successful cell. This is why I don't work in viruses. They kind of freak me out. Viruses are just information. They have no memory, v very little memory. So you can, I can email you a virus. You can print it out, have it synthesized by someone, and they'll give you the actual DNA. You put it into a cell and virus pops out. I cannot do that with a cell because a cell is dependent on a state of information that it inherited from another cell. Uh, we might not ever get to your talk, but <laughs> If I can ask a stupid physicist question, um, so protein folding is driven by like electrostatic forces. So isn't that reversible? Can't you just you can definitely unfold a protein, but when you refold it, will it take on the same shape? What this is a chaperone are other proteins that the cell makes that ensure that certain proteins fold properly. And those chaperones sometimes only get expressed when the cell is stressed out. So if you heat up a cell, it'll start making chaperones to make sure certain proteins don't fold wrong because of the heat. Wow. I've just commented since people are asking about proton, uh, protein folding, they might want to look up the Folded at Home project. That was a very interesting one. Something like 50,000 authors on the paper eventually. Yeah, you can download software that will run on your computer in idle time that will work on some of these problems because it's molecular dynamics. You can model all the individual chemical interactions, but it still has to be proven that the model is right by going back and actually crystallizing proteins. And obviously, that's a very difficult problem because you might be able to crystallize or even solubilize a protein, but is that actually the state it has in the cell, which has a very different environment because the whole point of it being a cell is in, it's keeping homeostasis, which is not necessarily conducive to crystallizing something and taking an x-ray of its structure. So biology is a difficult science. But this is how you might think of bioengineering is we're trying to have an impact on the DNA. So in history, when we're domesticating things, our impact on the DNA has been entirely from that puppy is friendlier than that puppy. So I'm going to breed him to that other friendly puppy. And hopefully whatever is going on in the DNA and the friendliness is going to come in there, the next litter. And over litter, over litter, over litter, we're changing, we're fixing things in the DNA. That has been the best approximation we've had until the molecular biology age when we started to be able to say, I can actually go in and legit turn that T into an A. I can do that at the DNA level. Now let's see what happens next. There is a big difference there, though, because when people are selectively breeding, they don't know whether what they're preserving is the history. As you separate it into information and history, they don't know whether they're selecting for the information or for the history. Right. And they so do know the which traits are heritable because they can see it. Right, you can see, but the heritability doesn't in itself tell you where it's encoded. No, no, and it there does may not. Be some mistakes about what's encoded where. There's definitely that. There's also a very broad ambiguity. What I like to tell people, and I go out and talk to people who are anti GMOs quite a bit, and I respect that position, I understand it. One of the arguments I have is that if we had the same tools for DNA editing when we were making the dog, I could make you a golden retriever without hip dysplasia. Because when you select for the DNA so broadly by individual, you're bringing along everything that's linked to it. So the gene you care about is up here, and it's right next to a gene for uh, uh, cartilage formation. So you're picking for this, but you're bringing along that because they're so close. And it's, uh, you're noticing that both are heritable, and some, and, but this you care more about. It's a very imprecise act breeding, and that's why it takes so long. You throw away a lot of ones that are great but not perfect. And that, that's just how it's been until molecular biology came along. We started stealing tricks from bacteria and being able to go edit the DNA directly. And that was supposed to be the promise of really teasing out which bits are but where. There could be very important heritable traits that aren't in the DNA. 
and then bioengineering doesn't know how to access them. You're talking maybe about epigenetics, which is the study the of history. information that is encoded and in inheritable, but not in the DNA. Exactly. Yeah, it's called epigenetics. One big example is mitochondria, which are passed down from the mother, and it's not DNA. They, mitochondria do have their own DNA in them, but the mitochondria you get when you're first just a single cell, you got them all from your mom. So it's heritable, but it's not DNA, and it has a big impact. If you get diseased mitochondria, you will have disease. Uh, we're, this has been a big limit in bioengineering, and I don't do multicellular organism bioengineering for exactly this reason. This, this, is, this is a whole minefield of to function sequence. If you still can't tell which pieces of the DNA have which function, you definitely don't know which function belongs to not the DNA. But a good example would be the cell walls and, and, and organelles, that, like a mitochondria, they're inherited. That is definitely information that's getting passed along in the cell, but it's not encoded in the DNA. And yeah, bioengineering doesn't really have an answer for that yet. In some senses, they would say they don't have to because the engineering is about the outcome. Like you're eating GMO tomatoes, you are eating plants that have been genetically engineered, you have pets in your house that have been genetically engineered, and they're working fine. So now we're getting really, we're getting quibbly. But what happened? Now, I told you we can edit DNA directly. Maybe in the microbes, it's a lot easier than in your dog or your cat. But we still don't have glowing buildings. We do not have biofuel at scale at a price point that's competitive with petroleum. We're missing antibiotics. We are still farting, which is entirely controlled by microbes. That, what, what's really happened? And the, the problem that we have that we have to start approaching with better information and um, learning is hype. And DNA is not a code. Even I use the word, it's encoded, it's encoded. We made a mistake and we let people think that DNA was a code, we kind of ran with that metaphor. So now I can program DNA, it's gonna do what I want. That's not what DNA is for. I, that's why I told you it's a memory. DNA is a history. It is not a programming language. So your metaphor then, it goes, cells are information processors. DNA is a programming language. And yes, I blame physicists for this. <laughs> DNA sequencing and PCR allow you to figure out what the parts are, and then you recompose these into circuits. So you steal parts from all these organisms all over the planet that you've sequenced, and then you put them back together in one cell and run it. Like hit, you've compiled it into DNA and you hit go. And uh, this does not work. It has not worked. It has not worked, and this is really holding back the bioeconomy. Remember, I always tell students an analogy that saves you time wastes somebody else's money. If I had a car that I said I have better airbags and I'm going to put these airbags in this car and it's going to take a little bit more time to make the cars, but they're going to be safer at the other end. None of the cars going down that assembly line go, you know what, I make car babies faster if I leave the airbags out. <laughs> I'm going to have a car baby that leaves the airbags out, and that car baby is going to have more car babies faster because it doesn't need to make airbags. And then out the other end of the assembly line, you're getting cars with no safety features because it goes fast and they get to eat more resources. This is why bio, bioengineering is not mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. The number one rule of bioengineering is that you make imperfect copies of yourself. That is our fundamental rule. Cells are not computers that run circuits. They are self-replicators that optimize for conditions. So you design something, you put some DNA in there, they copy themselves imperfectly. And then they're still running this DNA that might now be imperfect. They're still in a condition or the condition has changed. And that is a selection stamp. It is, does this DNA copy, does it still work? Can I still live? Can I still replicate? And this keeps happening. This happens overnight in bacteria. So you can put your DNA into a bacteria and in the morning you come back and you've got this and it bears no resemblance to what you put in. Bioengineering can't be about an expression of our will on the substrate. It has to be more like domestication. This chassis analysis uh, analogy breaks down really quickly. I said erythromycin comes from Saccharopelosphoria erythrea. You can believe they've tried really hard to get E. coli to make it. E. coli is sort of like our sidekick bacteria. It's the first one we really got to know. Every single bioengineering student, every single biology student, they get to work with E. coli, even in high school. In this country, we have made E. coli high school material. They get to put DNA into it. They see it glow in the dark. We have control over bacteria. You better believe they have tried to get that very difficult 
bacteria, grows in strings, has all kinds of big genome and a lot of recalcitrance towards cooperating with people, you can bet they've stolen the genes out of there and try, put them in E. coli and yeast and try to get them that are so friendly and manipulable and you can change the genes and feed them sugar. It does not work. It has not worked. It has not worked. It has not worked to put xanthan gum in. It has not worked to get the amino acids for MSG in. It does not work for the precursors for plastics and biofuels. They won't do it. It definitely doesn't work when you start to get into things that cells don't normally make and you need to start mutating towards it. These guys, these old standbys, these models, they're not good models for production. It is no different from saying, I see a cow out there eating grass and making milk, but I'm scared of the horns, so I've got a dog here, and they're both four-legged animals. This is actually a better, I, you know, I wouldn't invest in this company, but if you told me you were gonna make milk and dogs, I'd be like, well, I can, dogs do make milk already, <laughs> right? They're mammals. They're, the, cat, uh, the dog and the cow are more closely related than the bacteria that we're putting up opposite E. coli here. And just because they're tiny little cells that look like tiny little cells does not mean they're in any way related. That they've been separating for as many years or more as we have from fungi. So what, why do people pursue this? Why do they continue to pursue this? Uh, it's really about that. Some, we, the whole field took 20, 30 years to really pound on E. coli. When we first pulled E. coli literally out of our butts because it's a biomedical accident that it's E. coli, that we're just looking at things in sick patients and this one's, there were plenty of other bacteria at the time that were also very interesting, but somehow it's just an accident. It was E. coli. And everyone focused on E. coli because everyone else was using it. And so you start debuting tools. You're like, look, I got it to do this. And everyone starts using that tool and it only works in E. coli, but that's okay because we're all working on E. coli. And you get to today and everything that the vendors sell, everything that the students are trained on is all E. coli. And that is like training everyone to work with dogs and then sending them out to catch horses. <laughs> they, they can't, they can't do it. But if you write a grant to say, oh, I'm going to work in this brand new bacteria, you are out on your own. You don't have protocols for transforming it, for putting DNA in. You don't have protocols for growing it. All of the equipment sold by the vendors only works in the range for E. coli and yeast. And maybe your guy likes to be hotter. You're going to have to pay extra to get an incubator that's hotter. The granting agencies are going to look at it and go, none of our reviewers understand, like, why can't you do it in E. coli? That is the number one question I get asked by everybody is, why can't you just use E. coli? So I think the proof is in the timeline, that we learned a lot from it, and now it's time to go re re reproduce that feat. And so I wanted to talk to you guys about what it's going to take to reproduce that feat, and to motivate it by all of these are functions you cannot put in E. coli that are even cooler than the ones we've talked about so far. The guy on the top left makes magnets, so he can align himself with the Earth magnetic field, so he can navigate himself away from too high of an oxygen tolerance. He, he's he's microaerophilic. He doesn't like a lot of oxygen, so he likes to know which way is up and down. The guy in the top middle, uh, you can sort of see a compartment inside there. It's called an anamoxisome. That's where he turns really high, rich nitrogen components into hydrazine, and then the hydrazine into something else. So he lives in wastewater P, lives in P, and turns P into rocket fuel. Uh, photosynthesis at this point is basically blase. The, these are cellulosomes converting all of our compost, any lignocellulose and cellulose to simpler sugars that can then be recycled. If it weren't for bacteria, we would be hip deep in our own waste. The guy on the left makes these little perfect gas vesicle airbags so he can control his position in the water column. Really interesting superstructures. You saw Myxococcusanthus earlier, that's the baby don't hurt me bugs that break down E. coli and form the fruiting bodies. Uh, these Frankia like to interface with plants and they're responsible for most of the pollen after the last ice age was from plants that could be colonized by these guys because they could pull nitrogen straight from the air and feed it to the plant. So when the glaciers pulled back and left all that nitrogen poor soil, if, if the plant would work with this bacteria, these bacteria took care of them. That's still how a lot of agriculture works. We're not fertilizing stuff, it's still growing bacteria, just like the bacteria in our gut. Plants have the bacteria all around their roots doing the same thing for them. It's really cool. They knock on the root door and say, hey, let me in. The plant tries them out, lets them in, and if they perform well, the plant keeps them and scabs around them, and if they don't, the plant just shuts down the root, kills them. No freeloaders around here. This guy makes this perfect nanolayer structure over the surface of the cell called an S-layer. It's just a perfect 
a single molecule that self-assembles into nanolayer sheets, uh, just we can't do it. We can't replicate it. None of these functions can be moved into E. coli, and you can think of many, many, many biomedical, industrial, physical applications for all of these things. So why are we still feeding dogs grass? That was the question you spoiled, was why is this still happening? <laughs> happens because, you know, E. coli is our model organism. We trained everybody on it, and we take infrastructure for granted. There's also the street lamp fallacy, which is, you know, the tools are there, I have to work there. So why are you working in E. coli? I don't know how to work in Saccharopolisporia erythrea, and I already have the dog bowls, the dog food, the dog names. I mean, they have cute names for all their projects and stuff. The difference between synthetic biology and computer science is when computer science's substrate gets cheaper, they know what to do with it. So this is our Moore's, uh, this is our curve, where it's the price of DNA sequencing and synthesis, so how to read DNA and how to write DNA. It's like how many transistors can you fit on a chip for biology. And the price is really dropping. It is really cheap. That's why I told you, we sequence with abandon. We just read sequences all the time. Uh, writing them is getting cheap enough that we're just like, hey, yeah, just try synthesizing that and stick it in E. coli and see what happens. But we are not really figuring out what is actually happening because, as I told you, these sequences don't work in E. coli. We want to be bioengineers, so we try to design, build, test, learn. But because of uh, the sequencing bottleneck, the, sorry, the function <coughs> bottleneck, where we do not know what the sequence does, our curve is lopsided. So why aren't we learning? There's no labels. That is 100% the problem. We really don't appreciate bacteria at all either, because bacteria are going to fix this problem for us. You see a lot of these tree of life things. They got you fooled. They think you make you think bacteria are the simplest form of life on the planet. That is not even right. They're just as old as we are. They just picked a different niche to specialize in. I don't like this one much better. Most of the things on this tree are things you can see. But the bacteria on this planet have a biomass we think equal to all the plants on the planet. That's a huge amount of organisms to not be able to manipulate or understand how they're doing what they're doing. Uh, they exist in every niche on the planet. Five pounds of you is bacteria, and you'd be dead without them. They, we just Bacteria run this planet. We're not even helping. So model organisms are different. Dif Non-model organisms are difficult. We want to say, OK. Let's make magnets, let's do photosynthesis, but which of these bacteria do we bring in? How do we manipulate them when we don't have a roadmap for it? And how do you grow them cheaply? Because now it's, it's got to be about the cheap. The reason E. coli and yeast biofuels have not taken on is because yeast and E. coli are very domesticated. They like to eat glucose. Glucose costs $300 a metric ton. You can get glucose by um, refining compost and things, but that refinement costs energy. We know that compost and other things disappears, right? It gets converted, basically for free, not by E. coli or yeast. If you want to pair cheap biomass, renewable substrates, to something like biofuel production, you have got to be able to feed it for less than $300 a metric ton, because you're never going to catch up to petroleum at that rate. So how do you grow it cheaply? How do you feed it cheaply? How do you have cheap inputs and expensive outputs? We have to understand these systems to build up to complex systems. You'll hear a lot now about the microbiome. They say, OK, we understand the bacteria running things, but we still can't decompose them or understand them individually. So we'll just try to manipulate the whole set, which is running before you can walk. We really need to break it down. And what the part I thought you guys would be interested in was the auto automated phenotyping. So a phenotype is a set of an organism's behaviors. That is what we mean by a phenotype. The genotype is the sequence, what the sequence says. but that, like I said, that's easy to read from sequencing. The phenotype, that's what you really need to know to begin to engineer its behaviors. What is it doing under different circumstances? And that is all the information we don't have. Remember I showed you all the plants? There are kale and cabbage and broccoli. If you go decide you want to landscape your front lawn, you can go look up plants that will grow in this much water in these, uh, what do they call them, trophic zones or the, the temperature that gets, how cold it gets at night, how much sun. We have classifications for all those plants. You can landscape your garden with that much precision. None of that stuff exists for bacteria. I want a bacteria that grows at a pH of 4, just as past as it does at a pH of 7, tolerates a salt concentration of 5%, and excretes X dicarboxylic acid on a substrate of mannose but not maltose. I cannot find it. There's no way to find it. 
and this is simple stuff. It's a, way, it's a lot faster to do than growing plants and then figuring out how much light it actually needs. Yeah? So by, by phenotype, do you, do you mean all that's the, the, the structure or the mechanisms that are responsible for the structure to the right of the proteins? I mean the proteins themselves. What is that protein for? Okay. And so we know that it has a gene encoded in the DNA that makes a protein. What is that protein doing? What is that protein doing? Is that protein using magnesium to cut DNA? Is that protein converting one sugar into another sugar? Is that pro what is that protein doing? We don't know. Is that protein forming a pore in the cell wall that allows things in? We don't know. Okay. And likewise, the cell wall themselves, the reticulous. That we're not as, I'm not as worried wall. about that. I'm going to take that as a given. I don't need to engineer those pieces. Oh, my, my presumption is that E. coli can't do it for lots of reasons, including its cell wall and its complement of enzymes. It's very well suited to living in our gut and very poorly suited to living in wastewater. But when I go into wastewater and I find a bacteria that's doing well there, I will take its cell wall and everything. It's doing well there. But I cannot change its behavior or make it make something else out of the wastewater other than methane because I can't engineer it. And I don't understand how it's doing what it's doing either. A quarter of the genes in E. coli, we still don't know what they do. And we've been studying E. coli for 80 years. So just, again, just to test that, so then starting with the cell wall, there are certain properties of the cell wall that, that have sort of a footprint in, in the DNA. In so the, the cell wall uh, is made up of fats and proteins. And those genes that make those are encoded in the DNA. Okay. And the, and the mechanism whereby the spatial distribution gets created and, and maintained? We don't know. Okay. Or I don't know. That's definitely not my specialty is the, uh, infrastructure, the structure of cells. We know that bacteria take on different shapes. There's rods. There's spheres. And that's definitely something that is genetically encoded. Or maybe it's uh, in, intrinsic into the shape of the proteins that are forming the things. But it's not clear. And some of it's because we don't have the tools to study it, because that, we don't understand is what they're something doing. Like uh, you know how stem cells in humans can take on various functions. Is there, is there some fundamental bacteria-like thing that can you can you know like some ancient bacteria maybe that, that had this potential built in? I don't think so. Uh, stem all of the cells in your body have all the same DNA. They all have the yeah. same genotype. Even your stem cells have the same genotype as your, and what you're talking about is the difference in phenotype. So your stem cells have the ability to be pluripotent right. and to take on different jobs. And by doing that, they differentiate. Um, bacteria have a fraction of the DNA that a single one of your stem cells does. There's no ability for them to suddenly process uh, your urine or something if they weren't already doing that and they specialize in just that. So multicellularity is a whole philosophical discussion we should have at the bar about yeah economics of who's going to do what and who's going to get paid what. And that's how we become multicellular. Now, is it the case that the history of the bacteria is completely wiped out by the, by the billions of years of evolution? So there's no way to get back at, you know, the earliest bacteria or, or it, I'm getting at the origin of life and yeah. how bacteria got so. Physicists love that. They want to be able to decompose it into a simulation where we, you hit the button and you run it and it happens yeah, again, exactly. right? Not happening. Beca because life changed the planet as it changed itself, right? right? The first right, species right. to really threaten global destruction was a bacteria. It oxygenated the planet, nearly killed itself and everybody else. And so that change in what metals were soluble in water because of the oxygen in the atmosphere changed the course of history of the planet. And it was an accident that that happened because the ability to tolerate oxygen was an accident that it happened. There's, there's a lot of variables in this. I'm not going to say we can never backtrack to the origin of life, but it is a complex interaction of genomes and environments and other genomes and we all act on our, each other yeah. and so yeah. even me decomposing it into just I'm going to just study bacteria I am leaving a lot and right. because my focus as an engineer is what can I get them to do not as I'm not a basic scientist anymore so I'm not trying to get figure out the meaning of life anymore I'm trying to harness the life that's in front of me effectively but I'd love to talk to you about it at the bar <laughs> ditto <laughs> <laughs> so automated phenotyping all of that long bio intro was to get you to the actual, OK, let's get some robotics in here. So they call me the germ wrangler. The first thing you have to do about germs, about any organism you're going to train or domesticate, is to phenotype extensively. So you guys have pets, right? Everybody, you can buy a book about which conditions not to keep your cat or dog in, right? They have optimal temperatures. You're not supposed to feed them chocolate. 
or garlic. We don't know that about these bacteria. We don't know. So one of the reasons we don't know is we went running ahead of ourselves in sequencing. Sequencing is very well automated. You can deposit a sample and it'll get processed up and split up and put into the robots and the machines will read it and the computers will QC it and very few people need to be involved in the process anymore. But because we're comparing all of the sequences to E. coli basically, and I'm simplifying a bit, there's other organisms that are modeled at different stages like Arabidopsis for plants or yeast for fungus. We go sequence something from the Mariana Trench and we bring it back and we compare the genes in it to E. coli so we can guess which ones are genes and what they do. We have never seen the guy in the Mariana Trench that we collected. We've never seen him in action. We don't know what his phenotype is. So how can we compare the genes? And it turns out that our RNA, this is a really embarrassing mistake, ribosomal RNA is also encoded in the DNA. These are things that never become protein. It's RNA, it never becomes a protein, it just makes RNA. But because of ancient evolutionary hiccups, RNA is absolutely required for the function of the cell. It's very, very well conserved. You can spot RNA in bacteria and in humans. It, you know what it is. There are in our national databases of DNA, ribosomal RNA is annotated as proteins. So they've read it, they looked at it, and they were like, we think this is a protein. And they put it in there as a protein, like a putative protein. And then everybody else who goes and sequences finds our RNA and compares it to the known database. And they go, oh yeah, that's some protein of unknown function. And they said that um, matching of the rRNA uh, in the non-redundant database, the false positive rate is like 90%. It's, it's, it's not OK. Uh, PFAM is a consortium that tries to help break down understanding of how proteins work. They created a protein family for rRNA. And this is, uh, this is not good. This, this is not good. We, we are gathering so much data, we have no idea what to do with it. So I, this is E. coli, the most well understood bacteria on the planet. And I sorted these by um, putative or unknown. And we still have 806 genes where the description in E. coli is probably. And this is the next best studied bacteria, Bacillus subtilis. I call this one the cat because we think we got it, but we don't. And it's a 1,286. Now we're talking about out of 4,000 genes. 806 genes out of 4,000. So we can fix this with experimentally validated annotations. Yep? So can I ask you what the infrastructure that you're using to put that data in? So this? It fills it, is it, how does it come up to exist? So anyone who sequences with, in this country, federal money needs to deposit their sequences and the annotations of those sequences into NCBI GenBank, the National Center for Biotechnology at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. So these are, this is a GenBank database that's open to the public. Anyone, you can go there and just search any of the organisms that have been sequenced with public money and some that haven't. They were deposited here to generate, the, well one is because what else are you going to do with them right now? It's the sequencing is not, has not turned into, okay now I can do bioengineering. So it's kind of worthless. But you're relying on the researcher to put this in and to do it right. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, which, that's a whole other conversation, too. You should go out to the Joint Genome Institute, which is a Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, facility here. It's a user facility where they will sequence uh, agricultural and energy-related organisms at no cost to the researcher if they're in the DOE mission. And they have a huge an awesome bioinformatics pipeline that is dedicated to making sure as much as we can know about the sequence gets put in properly. So if that, that whole study is called annotation. So you sequence it and now you have to literally say a gene starts here, a gene stops here, and we think this gene does this. This is not a gene, this is a tRNA, this is a ribosomal RNA. It's called annotation and this is our best source of annotation in this country. So how much of the problem of annotation is um, technical and how much is social? If I have a paper published on a genome that I've sequenced and I've annotated and it's then proven wrong, all my papers are chunk. My reputation goes down the, uh, down the pan. I guess that's one way to think of it. Uh, one, the main problem that I am seeing and the way I'm targeting it is less that they don't want it annotated properly and that they don't, there's no an infrastructure to annotate it properly. So to annotate this way by comparison, 
Uh, I said labeling data, you, you know, everyone's talking about using machine learning with d data. You can't do that with annotations because we don't have enough functional data for you to actually build classifiers. It all has to be unsupervised learning. So all annotations done by clustering. So you got your new sequence for your new organism and you cluster it to known things. And then they say, we guess that this is a, a putative adhesion and that's the annotation that you put forth. It's not that you don't want to know what it actually is or you can't, it's just that it will cost you so much money to now go in, knock it out, and see if it stops sticking to things that you can't. So I don't think that there is an, an unwillingness to re-annotate. In fact, uh, any, the, the genome databases are pretty good about re-annotating. If you get new data on a sequence and you go, hey, we think this is this, they will go back and re-annotate everything. This is all a computational effort at this point. There is no actual biology left. Once you've got the sequence out, it's all information. You can do whatever you want with it. That, that's not really a big barrier. It's more that to actually generate that functional information takes some elbow grease that no one wants or has been able to assemble the, the means for. OK, so the functions. How, how well do you even know what possible functions can be? Well, you know what the cell is doing in a broad sense in that I put this sugar in and I grow it in these conditions and this came out, gas came out, this, it changed this pH and you can kind of read those things and say, oh, while it did that, it made these things. So therefore, there must be a gene here to catalyze this reaction. So this sugar has to enter into the cell membrane, so there must be a transporter. The transporters are kind of easy to see with the, fun they look like holes, right? They punch a hole through and they, so the sugar has to come in and then the sugar has to get broken down from six carbons to three carbons. So there must be these sorts of enzymes. A lot of these metabolisms are very conserved. So if you see it in one, you can spot them. I'm not saying that all annotations are immediately bunk, but when you start straying from things and looking for functions that you've never seen before, comparing them to functions you have seen is not as helpful. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's... It's, well, okay. Please continue, please continue. More questions come up. It's another variant on that. So, so could you say that uh, what these annotations are, the vocabulary of annotations is hopefully adequate to, to, ex to talk about, in some manner of talking about, uh, the possible reaction dynamics. Oh, yeah. They're, they have very good ontologies for genes and sequences. For so, so in a sense, it's, and the reaction dynamics are, are sort of described by some kind of a, a network. You yes. Know, a a label, label network with probably... Yep, we have metabolic maps. We have beautiful metabolic... And some of the very prettiest ones are from LBL right here. So, so one, of, one of these annotations refers to, say, a subnetwork in some sense. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's kind of... It, it's, not an atom, it's not an atomic sort of... It, one annotation might be talking about this area, another annotation about this area of the diagram, another annotation just completely yes. talk, talks about, I don't know, ligand. And ligand if I drew a bacterial properties. genome for you, they're circular. Bacteria tend to freak out with linear DNA. Not all, there's exceptions, though. There's bacteria that have linear genomes. But you'll start reading, you'll get this whole sequence, you'll represent it as a string. You don't write, and you'll have a genes here, 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 and here, and these are all working in the same set of that metabolic network, but they're very disparate in space. How do you know that they're all in that network? Until you have actually seen the cell working, you don't necessarily. In other cases, you'll have, you'll have three genes right in a row, and they're definitely, we can assume that those are working on the same section of the metabolic network until it turns out they're not. It's very complex. It's very complex, and there's a lot of noise in here too because the cell doesn't delete a gene just because it's not using it anymore. I guess the notion of label it seems kind of so, so, kind of I'm, simplified with respect to the relationship. I'm using label as a machine learning term okay. for function. The proper the proper thing is I don't know what the function of this is, and if I don't know what the function of it is, I cannot say what the function of the gene that clusters with it in the next sequencing experiment is. So since I don't have that label, I can't form a classifier to say with a percent certainty. So you'll notice all of this putative adhesin, it does not have a, um, what do you call it? A, uh, it doesn't have a error bar. Error bar. Yeah. <laughs> because we have no quantitation, it's just unsupervised learning. So if uh, label is a technical term in the machine learning field for, let me actually put some certainty on it. So um, 
You said that uh, you have this putative adhesin, for instance, but to actually verify that it is one, they send an expensive experiment to go back and do. And not in E. coli necessarily, but in everything else. Yeah, on, the, on the general case, it's more expensive to go back and verify than just assume it's right and go ahead and publish. Yeah. So, where you could possibly use machine learning is to look at which papers are coming out, which are relying on which set of associations and decide that this one is actually worth going away and verifying because it can validate or invalidate a huge chunk of science. You want to go in with me? <laughs> I actually work with the phone dealer. Uh, this is where I'm headed. I, I want to go experimentally validate as many of these annotations as possible and generate new annotations that you can back up with an observation. Um, because we need to start working on, we need to close this gap. If we let the sequence and function gap widen too much more, we're, I, I worry, that's, that's all. I think, I think I've demonstrated enough for you to maybe share some of my worry. So culturing is possible. One of the myths you'll hear about bacteria is, oh, but so many are unculturable. This guy, I recommend reading some of his saltier papers from his emeritus years, Howard Guest. He's actually was uh, worked on the Manhattan Project, but then got into bacteria, which happens a lot. I tell everyone, you're gonna end up in biology, you just are. But he wrote some really salty little papers that are very accessible uh, about how physicists mess up biology. <laughs> and uh, so he's hating on Schrodinger and uh, the modern myth of uncultural bacteria. There's no such thing as an unculturable bacteria. They're not eating moonbeams and stardust. So this is the first myth I usually have to dispel is I tell people I'm gonna grow every bacteria that I can and phenotype them. And they go, but you can't grow most bacteria. So they are just zombies? I, I don't know how to explain that one. It, now that doesn't mean every single bacteria is worth growing and it doesn't mean that they will all grow fast, but they are not unculturable. Uh, the next thing to do is to check their ranges. I ask people if they knew that E. coli can grow in seawater. It's kind of assumed that it doesn't. That's not true. It can grow in seawater. That has profound implications for water processing and biocontainment and things. Is this a bacteria you want to be making biofuel in if it can get out and survive in seawater? No. But if you don't know what its ranges are, how are you going to do biocontainment? So I want to start by demanding more. The data you can typically gather about bacteria is everything that has an icon next to it. You'll notice there is nothing here in the, this is what I need to actually grow it range. So the reasons for this are good. It's because the biomedical history of bioengineering has been, I'm sorry, the history of bioengineering has been biomedical. The most money and the highest need has been to make sure we don't die of these things, not that we make biofuel from them. So all of the stuff up here that you can find, and which is not even everything I want, is basically medically motivated. Uh, you need to know this to know how it's going to go septic or how it's going to interact with human tissue. You need to know its gram status because that's a big divider in which antibiotics you're gonna treat it with. Uh, you wanna know its oxygen tolerance because that means can you get it from a can or are you gonna get it from free air? Uh, you don't really need to know any of these things to treat it. <laughs> So bioengineering is lagging on that biomedical side. We need to kind of establish non-biomedical microbiology as its own thing with these standards. And that's just growing. To manipulate it is a whole other set of things. And I've put things here, there, these are, you can get this information, but don't let me fool you into thinking that this is in any way organized towards manipulation, because it's not. Sarah? Yeah. Um, if sort of the, I thought that the philosophy of medicine is kind of like shifting toward being more preventive medicine. Does that sort of, would that then also naturally create a shift into wanting to know more about like, how do you cultivate bacteria so that you can avoid those conditions? For the, uh, the metagenome and people's microbiome, yeah. You kind of, you'll see really papers about microbiomes where they go say, hey, we've figured out every species of bacteria that's in your stomach. Uh, what they haven't done yet, they haven't been able to do, or is at what time, after what feeding, in which people, on which water sources, and which continents, because it will change, it changes dynamically. You eat something and your microbial population is changing, and what it does changes. So you could keep the same microbial population, but enter a different context, and they, so yes, you're gonna want to start knowing this, but you're gonna have to decompose that um, ecosystem, because all these bacteria actually are feeding each other. So just because you pull one out, 
w the reason they think they're unculturable is because he needed his buddies to feed him stuff. That he does one task in the ecosystem and then somebody else is doing another task. And if you just pull him out and you don't know anything about him and you can't read his genotype to predict a phenotype to say, oh, I'm going to need to supplement him with this nutrient, he's not going to come out for you and explain things to you. Does that make sense? You really, we need to gather more functional data about the stuff that we can cultivate individually so we can start cultivating more things so we can learn more about their function and then we can start doing some of these really cool metagenome experiments. So, so at this level of notion of phenotype, that's, does it include the notion of replication or do you just have to include replication anyway because you talk about growing? Uh, the closest here would be generation time. How long does it take to replicate itself? Just sort of thinking that, that uh, in, in terms of complexity, that replication is more more complex than, say, pH tolerance or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the first thing I have, if you can't replicate, you die. I never see it. Yeah, well, in terms of, I would say I don't even do math on my experiments. The, the complexity, the, the metabolic footprint of, of that operation is probably <laughs> involves a lot. And therefore, the genetic footprint is... is that's a nice thing bacteria have got going is uh, they're simpler, so their replication is a little simpler. It, there are a lot of moving parts, don't let me lie. But uh, it is still genetically inherited what your generation time is. How much stuff are you moving around and how fast can you do it? And when do you feel safe to begin replication? So um, tip, again, I'm an engineer, so I am abstracting out a layer that I'm not going to bother to understand that it just work, and that one is cell replication. Okay, you caught me. Uh, yeah, phenotyping is chemical behavior in context. I want to know what it's doing in every condition, and I'm going to use robotics to do it. I am going to grow these bacteria at every temperature. I'm going to grow them in every carbon source. I'm going to grow them at every pH. I'm going to grow them with every possible terminal electron acceptor, and I'm going to see what they do in each of those conditions. Which proteins are they actually making? Which proteins do they stop making? What happened to his friends? Their friends. Yeah. I'm going to start with the ones that don't need friends. Okay. <laughs> or they do need friends, but in the lab we accidentally or we take for granted the fact that we figured out this guy, you have to grow him by adding methionine. He can't make his own methionine. Now in the wild, he's living with buddies that make methionine for him. We sort of abstracted that away. We're like, oh yeah, here's the growth medium for this bacteria. If you want to grow it, you just add methionine. And most of the time, I have to confess, they don't even know it's methionine necessarily. They just know that they have to put yeast extract in. So yeast extract is a microbiological miracle food where you grow up a bunch of yeast and then you kill them all and you dry that down and feed it to other yeast. <laughs> and that yeast extract contains all of the things that were in the yeast that make life happy like vitamins and minerals and um, amino acids and other things, trace stuff. And you don't have to know exactly what your guy needs because it'll be in the yeast extract. You don't know how much he needs or when he needs it. You just feed him yeast extract. That's called an undefined medium. And it doesn't teach you a lot about what's actually going on inside your bacteria. So one of the first tasks for us is to define a media. When you define a media, and I'll show you the robot I want to use to do that. Um, yeah, we, we need better labeled data. This is just an example of how diffuse our databases are. Each column is a different bacteria, and then each row is a different database and what its designation in that database is. So they all have different names, they have different numbers, they have different uh, designations, and a lot of these databases are just storing the genome data in this same genome data in a different database with a different number. It's because genome is, sequence has been really easy to get. So one of the first things we did was to say, we need to define a way to store this data in a way that is not like everyone else is storing it so that we can actually get at what we're missing and then compare things that we do know. So I could actually pull out, hey, this bacteria in the database that has this uh, behavior, what is the closest bacteria to it by some taxonomic standard? Like, I want something that's also gram positive but is not nectinomycete. And also, I would like him not to be able to eat maltose. When we're done populating with this phenotype, we'll be able to do that, which will give us a jump on anyone else trying to engineer bacteria by just starting with, I'm not sure which one I should use. This data, this, this will, be, will be the Facebook of bacteria, basically. We'll be able to pick out exactly who's susceptible to buying a couch because you show them an ad. Uh, so here, there have to be robots, right? So here's one of the robots that will make this possible. This, I took this from their their literature, this is not me using it. 
It's called a uh, mantis. It actually looks a bit like a praying mantis and it dispenses liquid in little amounts. So now imagine that you have one and each one of those tubes that it's feeding itself from is a different amino acid, a different oxytrophy. Now you can test in these little plates you grow the bacteria in. So instead of having one of my technicians <sighs> try to remember which well, which amino acid goes into, you just write, you just submit an Excel spreadsheet to this robot. All of the robots I need to do this exist. I don't need to build any, I don't need to design them. I just need to harness them in a manner and gather the data that has not been done before using bacteria that are not E. coli. One other thing you have to do with these bacteria, um, the standard unit for microbiology and molecular biology is 96, 96 wells. So standard plate, it looks about this big. It's got 96 wells in it. It's terrible for growing bacteria in, and they do it all the time because high throughput, all the robots are using 96 wells. Well, they don't shake very well, so you don't get aeration. You do not get oxygen to those bacteria, which means they start behaving in ways that they only behave in when they don't get oxygen. And you go, oh great, I did a high throughput assay and that bacteria in this well did the best. And then you grow him up with proper oxygen and shaking and he doesn't do it anymore. So you need to not go for that immediate scale of 96 wells, come back down to 48 at least. I like these flower plates, they're rosetted. So when you shake them, you actually get aeration and they have these sensors in them, right? So now I can read pH, I can read through the bottom, I can see how much biomass we're getting. I let the mantis fill these plates with various things. I put them in a micro fermenter and shake it overnight and I have a computer just read what is the bacteria doing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Control like a light source or is this all in the dark? Most of these you don't want necessarily light for. Light will change their behavior in ways that we're not prepared okay. <laughs> to deal I, with yet. I was yet. just wondering, concentrate on these first. And then yeah, 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 yeah. Once we've established a baseline and proved some novel stuff, then yeah, I think we're gonna go whole hog. People come and ask me all the time, that, uh, oh, can you test for this trait? That we're interested in traits. There's just not an infrastructure for reliably de-risking which one are you going to bet a million dollars on an infrastructure for. So what we're trying to do is de-risk all of it by building the infrastructure for all of it. So by compiling this kind of data, this is an example of one of these micro fermenters. You put it in overnight and it just takes pictures of your bacteria all night long. You get a, a curve out. So I'll be able to say, hey, when there's this much methionine and they grow like that. And when there's a little more, they grow a little less good. Something is going on there. You put it all into a database and the next step, which I'm not even gonna talk about, is how you now use that against them. <laughs> you gain their trust and uh, start co-opting them and domesticating them. So in terms of, you're just measuring, say, mass, not doing a count? No, we, uh, the standard in microbiology is not to do cell counts, but to measure what they call an optical density in the media where you know the blank, where there's nothing growing, and you just measure the absorbance at 600 nanometers, and, just, and you use that as a proxy for how, many, um, how much biomass is in there, how happy the cells are because they're dividing. Okay, so how many, how many individuals typically in one of these? I don't know, it, it, it okay. will also depend on the size of your... Or, or... Probably, there's, there's billions in there. Millions to billions. Sorry, biology is still squishy on that. Because for us, it really matters more that they're doing something. You can measure their output at the grams per liter scale than how many there were. So I am happy. That's, this is another reason E. coli hasn't been working for us. Say you want E. coli to make a compound. E. coli does not normally make. E. coli is going to make it because you put the genes in, but it has no way to export it necessarily. So if it's making it inside, it's unhappy because it doesn't like this thing. It's building up a lot of this and it's unhappy. The way they get around that is they let a lot of E. coli grow. They get a huge biomass of it in a huge fermenter, like 3,000 liters. And then they send it a, a chemical signal to turn on that DNA and make it and then kill it all. So that they had so many cells up and th that's where OD is really important. They're like, how? many can we get to grow in this dense environment so that then we can trick it into making a lot of this stuff by volume and not necessarily over time. If you make friends with the right bacteria that have the secretion pathway, you can just sort of cultivate them and flow and they'll just continually happily make something that you carry away from them because that's how it usually works in nature is that these are the reason they make it is to send a signal to somebody else. These are the words they use to communicate and even antibiotics are just words that mean not now or go away or this is mine or die. That's all an antibiotic is. It has to leave the cell to have an effect. So the, the OD we use as a sort of proxy for how happy the cells are by how many of them there are. And we, we haven't really worried about exactly how many there are. You can see how 
unquantitative we are already. <laughs> so yeah, context is everything. Sequence is just one dimension. Uh, you know, your dog eat, does eat grass sometimes, but why? Why is he eating grass? It's usually because he wants to puke, right? Or because he's bored? <laughs> I, so this is a question that has confounded me for years and I have a dog now that eats grass every time right before I walk him. Whereas another one only ate because he wanted to puke. So I think there are multiple reasons for eating. <laughs> I think so. I, and I think some just might like the taste. I think they do. You know? Some people chew on grass and some people like grass tea. Um, so but some the future. Like hops. Huh? Some people like hops. Some, some people, people like hops. hops. Yeah. And some people like bourbon. The future of genome engineering is going to be adding statistical confidence to our design by having these phenotyping platforms that are actually telling us with some confidence what that sequence does by function. So this is where I'm very nascent to these uh, information systems and automated learning and stuff is I'm going to try and build this for bacteria. I'm going to build the robotics automated learning infrastructure to go say that gene does this because we saw it 200 times in these microfermenters that every bacteria that had this set of genes behaved like that. We can use that as a statistical confidence that then I can go hand this gene to somebody or this bacteria and say, now this guy is a good guy to make hydrazine in. He's already there. He likes this pH. He likes these ammonia levels. Now you can start iterating on that instead. That is a de-risking and an increase in efficiency that will help people break out of that, well, we have to do it in E. coli because we're guaranteed to get the DNA in E. coli and we know E. coli will at least try to run it. And then we need to have that same knowledge base that I built gather the failures gather the failures and now we will actually start turning the crank we'll get better agriculture if you can get bacteria to put nitrogen directly into the plants instead of having to put hugely overkill amounts of nitrogen and that just wash out and cause blooms we we'll, can start working on bacteria that are capable of pulling heavy metals out of the water they do it for their own reasons and not for us Definitely work on the farts. That would be nice. Um, and of course, a really huge problem is how are we going to work on the antibiotic problem? Can we reach into bacteria and work on that directly? Can we get them to make new structures for us? So that is my talk.